Today, dramatic upheavals in global society have been met with incremental changes in preservation policy and practice. What kind of preservation field is needed by contemporary societies? What will future societies demand? Facing enormous existential and practical challenges, I don't think I need to name them, uh, we wish to reconsider the nature of preservation as a cognate field of study and practice and its role in intellectually, politically, and practically shaping built environments. The first event today, Preservation Futures and Society, will take up the question of historic preservation's contributions to and engagement with broader societal issues and needs. The other discussions will follow. You see them on the, on the screen. Uh, Preservation Futures and the Humanities on January 25th. Preservation Futures and Design on February 29th, and Preservation Futures and the Sciences in, on March 21st. If they're not up, I just gave you the dates. Okay. Um, these will all take place in Philadelphia. They'll be streamed live as well. Um, all will be free and open to the public. And our hope is that each session will result in a public white paper with an interactive web presence where the discussions can continue. So we look forward um, to your participation. So let me now introduce my faculty colleagues who will lead today's discussion and in turn introduce uh, today's panel. Um, for those on, on Zoom, please mute yourself. Um, Randall Mason is a professor in the Department of Historic Preservation and City and Regional Planning. His research interests include history and theory of preservation, preservation planning, the economics of preservation, historic site management, and the history and design of memorials. Amber Wiley is a presidential associate professor in historic preservation and the inaugural Matt and Erica Nord director of the Center for the Preservation of Civil Rights Sites. Her research interests center on the social aspects of design and how it affects urban communities, architecture as a literal and figural structure of power. She focuses on the ways local and national bodies have made the claim for the dominating narrative and collective memory of cities and examines how preservation and public history contribute to the creation and maintenance of the identity and sen sense of place of a city. With that, um, who'll be going first? R Randy, Amber? Mic check, one, two, okay, I just turned it on. Um, my job here is to give a little intro to our guests. So I'll be reading a short bio about each of them. I have to say that you can also find uh, the larger information about uh, their backgrounds on our website, at the, the Penn Weitzman website. And so I will not be going into that because everyone on this panel is very esteemed, extremely published, very much awarded. And so you can find all the, the great details of that. So I'll start here to my right, your left. Uh, Fallon Samuels Adu is a preservation planner interested in the history and future of real estate that is vital to cultural resilience and community survival, especially ethnic heritage threatened by disinvestment, development, deterioration, and disasters. That's a lot of good alliteration. Her research and teaching of urban design and development builds knowledge of real estate reinvestment, revitalization, and retrofit by governmental, private, philanthropic, and nonprofit organizations. And the lack thereof in places predominantly occupied by Black, Indigenous, and immigrant populations. And I'll just say here, I don't actually have it on my bio that Fallon is currently teaching at the Tulane School of Architecture in the Real Estate Development Program and the Preservation Program. Thank you. Uh, next to Fallon, we have Kimberly D. Bowes, who is a professor of classical archaeology here at the University of Pennsylvania. Her current research addresses the economic histories of Roman working people and the poor. Kim uses archaeological and historical evidence to reveal the lived experience of the 90%. I love that. I was like the 90%, the vast majority of the people who actually occupied the Roman Empire. Um, the majority of the ancient population who labored from small farmers to artisans, enslaved and free. 
we have Camille Z. Charles, who is the Walter H. and Lenore C. Annenberg Professor in the Social Sciences in the Department of Sociology and Africana Studies, and in the Graduate School of Education at the University of Pennsylvania. Her research interests are in the areas of racial inequality, racial identity, racial attitudes, intergroup relations, residential segregation, and higher education. So thank you uh, for allowing me to welcome our esteemed panelists. I look forward to the conversation that we'll be having. Uh, and one thing, I think this is something I'm, I'm going to get into the, the habit of doing, even though I always want to start with a disclaimer, is like I don't really fully believe in land acknowledgments because you're just acknowledging land. What are you doing beyond an acknowledgment? But I also feel it would be remiss to not begin a conversation about society, about preservation um, impacts therein and the relationships between those two topics without acknowledging the fact that we are sitting on the unceded land of the Lenny Lenape, um, which is, I don't want to call it ironic, but it's just the fact that I would say that when I was teaching at Rutgers before I got here, um, I could say that if I were teaching in Manhattan, <laughs> you know, I could say that if I were teaching in Delaware, like this, it's not just the University of Pennsylvania, we are sitting on a vast um, swath of land that was occupied by people before we even came into being. And so I just wanted to acknowledge that. Randy, take Great. it away. <laughs> Great. Thank you, Amber. Thank you to our our guests, we really appreciate you taking time out from your, your busy producing all this scholarship and, and leading all the things that you lead. And thanks to all of you who are joining us virtually and, and in person. The one practical note I'll start out with is that we'll, we'll have a, a hopefully fairly informal conversation for 45 minutes or, or so. Um, and then uh, depending on the time and energy uh, going in the conversation, we'll open it up to questions and comments from the audience with us here in Climate. Um, for those of you online following by Zoom, we, we welcome you to, to keep putting uh, comments and notes and questions in the chat, um, and we'll have a chance to respond to that after the event, but we, uh, we want to try to keep it, the conversation kind of in the room, just for the sake of clarity. Um, so uh, I'll ask the first question with a, just a slight preface to build a bridge between how Frank introduced the series of events and, uh, and, and this, this first one about um, society, this, you know, kind of um, admittedly amorphous and uh, kind of difficult to, to imagine target. Um, I'll, I'll start out by just acknowledging that, um, that preservation is a field, and I think we as a department and a community are continually trying to rethink and reevaluate and understand what our practice is. And this, you know, although we're, we're kind of formally sitting down to talk about it today, I think we're always all talking about it. And so this is just kind of like disclosing more about, about things that we think about when we imagine what historic preservation has been and what it could be. Um, the, the, the question in my mind that, that I think is really exciting about this series is, it, is that we're not trying, is not the, an attempt to try to understand what preservation is, but more to the point of understanding what preservation does and what heritage does and how, how do we not just instrumentalize it, but how does, when we, when we let it out into society, when we let it out off of our desks or out of our labs, what do we expect to happen? There's a long history that I, I also think is fascinating, but it's more nerdy um, about like how over time, there have been all these implicit ideas about how heritage works and how preservation works. Um, but I think we need to be a lot more explicit about it and, um, and, and more searching about what those impacts of, of heritage and preservation are out in the world. But to, to start um, the, the conversation among, among this particular group, um, we wanted to ask you first from your personal perspectives um, through the lens of your experiences and your work, um, how do you see heritage and preservation connecting to broader societal institutions and issues and, and, and groupings of society? And just because Camille made the mistake of sitting next to me, um, I'll, I'll look to her first to start off, but just a couple of minutes, maybe yeah. each of you to talk about personally where you come to heritage. Um, I, I actually hadn't thought about it in quite this way until you sent that question. Um, 
But I, I mean, I think for me and, and sort of understanding racial attitudes and um, inequality in the United States, and I think it also speaks to the comments you made, Amber, about land, um, and land acknowledgements um, is that heritage, you know, it tells us what we're supposed to value. Um, and so, um, you know, I often talk to my students about how racial attitudes and beliefs about racial groups in the United States are almost like in the air because we have a history of demonstrating value in particular things and telling particular stories in particular ways. Um, and, and that seeps in, it's not just the history books that we read or the things that we're taught in school, right? It's the monuments, it's the buildings that are allowed to, to remain and be restored versus the ones that um, are seen as disposable and torn down. It's the landmarks um, throughout a city and, and the extent to which certain areas are, um, are played up as places to see as part of the history of a place or not. Um, and, and so that then becomes part of what I call a sort of historical and cultural DNA that a society has. And so um, we have, in the United States, we have been taught to value certain parts of our history and to ignore other parts of our history. Um, we have been sort of um, to a greater or lesser degree coerced into believing that certain stories are true, and I'm using true um, in quotes, and that other stories are, are not true or are less true, that certain stories are important and certain events are important and other things are not. Um, and so as long as we continue to, to demonstrate those values in particular ways and, and to um, place less value on other kinds of things or places um, or stories, um, you know, I think that will dictate to a greater degree than we tend to take seriously our ability to reduce racial inequality, gender inequality, any any of those kinds of things. But you know, um, and we get and and historically we've we get wrapped up in those stories, right? And so um, even though we may learn more than some of us care to know about Christopher Columbus, we still don't want to let go of this glorified, sanitized version of our history because maybe because once you start to pull one string, a lot of other strings come undone as well. And then, you know, you start to have other kinds of questions you have to be held responsible for. Um, and so, so, I mean, I think there's that sort of ma more macro level where I think about heritage and and you know and what it means like i said the stories that we're told um just through again the the display um and even the direction to go and see a thing um you know everybody is told to come and see the liberty bell and independence plaza but you know there's a lot of um abolition history in germantown we don't get that kind of um that kind of traffic in our neighborhoods. Um, buildings that are old and historic are being torn down to gentrify the community rather than seeing the historic value in those buildings while in Old City, we do a lot to rehabilitate and maintain the the old look, right, of, of the buildings. And, and I think that has meaning um, and it it gives us messages about who is valuable as well as as what is valuable Kim. um you guys all hear me um so i'm going to take up your question so i come from a field of classical archaeology in which the monuments as well and the old shiny objects as well um and as an archaeologist who works on foreign working people, 90%, 
um, they they find themselves very awkwardly in that uh, spectrum of value. And I work, um, I think, unlike these guys, entirely outside of the United States. Um, in Italy, which if you talk to Messel, um, he will tell you has sort of monopolized the um, the definition of it was on. How about now? Better? Okay. Okay. Um, Italy. <laughs> I'll take this. Thanks. Um, has uh, had an outsized influence on um, what constitutes heritage value, what constitutes monuments, what constitutes the great list that is the UNESCO list of monuments. Um, and in working in that particular context on the past of foreign working people, um, I found my own work really running up against these kinds of systems of value that are associated with things and buildings um, in a couple ways that were really interesting to me as an archaeologist, and I think um, archaeology is a field. So the first is that I overwhelmingly work with modern farming communities, and farmers hate archaeologists for lots of good reasons. Um, they're a pain in the ass, they come and sit on your land and take your land away from you, and they never go away, and they're, they're a kind of like a vampire plague. Um, and in order for us to do our work, that couldn't be true. The other people we worked with were farming communities, um, mayors, people who are trying to keep together a, a kind of rural world which is vanishing. Um, and we went to them and we said, what can we do for you? What can this project do for your community? And she said, please don't build a house museum. Um, I happen to love house museums. Amber was talking about house museums um, a couple of days ago. Um, please don't build a house museum. You're going to give us a burden. If you build a museum in our village, we're going to have to look after it and no one will come and visit it. And then somehow all this money will have to be taken away from road maintenance. Could you give us some money to build roads or repair our roads? That's what I said. Well, no, actually, I can't. Um, so that's what the communities that we were working with were interested in. No monuments. Give us our land back. Um, and so we came up with a completely different way of doing archaeology, which deprivileged the monument and the object which was to, to, to dig as fast as possible so that in five weeks, farmers get their land back. Um, and on the first day of the sixth week, their land is returned to them and we're gone, we've recovered the site and they can literally plow the next day. Um, as a consequence of this, they saw us as people who respected what they did and saw us as co-stewards of the land because that's how they regarded themselves, right? We are the people who've been farming this land since the people that you've been digging up have been farming this land. Um, and so to respect that stewardship meant to non-monumentalize, right? Um, and to return things to the plow soil that we had pulled out of the plow soil. This is now increasingly working practice in archeology span as a whole which is good. I think in our case, what was unusual is the speed with which we did it. We worked according to farming and plowing and seeding schedules, which is a completely different arc of time <laughs> than, as Frank Montero can tell you, the arc of time that is the preservation of a historic site, which goes on sometimes for longer than it took to build the thing in the first place. <laughs> um, so we did sort of gonzo archaeology in part because of the partnership with our local communities. The other thing that we tried to convert the monument into were a set of stories for children. The mayor said, we don't want a house museum. Please come and talk to our school children. Tell them about their past. You're digging up the people who did what their parents do now, right? You're digging up ancient farmers. So come and talk to them about that world. And so instead what we did uh, is start uh, in collaboration with the second and fifth grade curriculum, um, a set of units to talk about the findings of the project in the context of their history program, um, in which they would also come out and dig with us and, and work with us in various ways. Because what they would, the actual material remains of what we were finding vanished. And the idea that that was a good thing was also part of 
what we were teaching them or helping them to come to terms with or thinking about. Um, that archaeology, and if you're in Italy, you grew up archaeology is a Colosseum, right? Archaeology is cool stuff in museums, but that's not what archaeology is, right? That archaeology is knowledge production. Archaeology is knowledge production that you do um, in communities in which you're increasingly uh, feel as though you have no hope and no contribution, and the only thing you can do is get out of your community. Um, so I would say that the non-monument, um, a radically different arc of time uh, and um, a recognition, and I think in different ways, um, everyone on this panel um, is wrestling with different economies, uh, so in my case, the ag agricultural economy, um, the different economies that um, confound and force us to rethink what stuff and things, particularly monuments, um, mean to the actual people who live with and in those monuments. Um, they're radically different kinds of economies. And in our case, that meant um, an, an economy that required the, the disappearance of the monument. Fallon, thank you. Okay, good. Well, I, I'm so glad that you brought up the arc of time um, as well as the non-monumental because a lot of how I have come into the, the work of historic preservation with the capital H is through the very time intensive labor of documentation, which is a critical, it's a core course in preservation education. It's a critical part of every um, preservation professionals, kind of professional development. Um, you're kind of like not seen as like a real preservationist if you can't do heritage documentation. And that process of documentation involves, I mean, it used to involve pencil and drawing, but it involves a very kind of meticulous attention to the object and what lends it your attention in the first place, right? It's character defining features or um, its relationship to some canon of architecture that we've been informed to, to recognize and, and value um, and see as a mirror of our values. Uh, but that skill set uh, that we're teaching still and that many of us were trained in is a skill set that I get to use less and less through the my engagement with people who are stewards of the very heritage that I've been trained to value. And so the, the work that I do um, as a preservation planner, which is an identity that I have ascribed to myself, planning as a discipline sees preservation as kind of like it's, I don't know, kind of, I wouldn't even say it's like bastard child so much as like, the, the 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 guests who won't get out of the house <laughs> um, and and so really what uh i often am doing i'm starting with the question of what value do you hold in this place in this property that is you see worth carrying into the future and what is infringing upon your capacity to actually engage in that stewardship and what contribution can I make to that process? Can I remove some of those barriers? Can I facilitate the practices that you're already engaging in, maybe generations and generations have engaged in? Um, and can I, can I enlarge your own perspective about how you see the problems, right? This is the kind of work that I'm often doing with um, with stewards, both individual families, institutions, and almost without question, even the big institutional actors who are governmental entities or um, kind of private trusts, historic trusts, are less and less interested in documentation of the heritage. And to some, it's part of a larger kind of worldview that is shifting to an understanding that 
this is not going to be here at some point. And why would I invest so much in that practice um, when there are so many other things worthy of our attention and our resources to kind of get a handle on? So that could be like understanding what is the existential threats. Like we should be measuring climate change, you know, risks. We could we should be measuring the economic pressures that are being um, imposed on us, not documenting in have style drawings, this building and the grounds around it. And so um, one of the critical questions that I have for my own work is um, society is a very kind of amorphous <laughs> um, term and, and, and concept, um, but the social has a little bit more technicity to it. And for me, like, how am I helping to socialize the ways in which we are as stewards doing the work of preservation? Because the things that were previously socialized in schools of architecture and in the profession of preservation no longer hold value. And um, so I'll, I'll end this bit on saying that um, one of the interesting results of social media platforms um, becoming, you know, as big as they are to kind of in heritage tourism, like the Instagrammable place, mm -hmm. right? Is that um, it's a different kind of mapping of a place's value than the than the GIS mapping, than the the survey um, mapping, and and any kind of reconnaissance type of mapping. And one of the uh, people, the descendants uh, that I work with on a, a property in Martha's Vineyard said, why, why don't preservationists learn how to code so they can scrape Instagram? Like, why isn't that the like, why isn't that a part of preservation methods? Cause she was like, she did an internship with the Heritage Trail and she thought maybe she might actually go to school. And she looked at the courses and she's kind of like, that's like, it's like a no brainer thing to me. Like we should be coding, we should be scraping, we should be doing the things that people actually, the ways in which people actually record heritage. And, and so I don't know how to um, reconcile, I'd say, I mean, I can, we can, decide, yes, we're gonna teach AI, we're gonna teach you know, coding. That's not you know, the point here, but how does one reconcile the actual ontology of that with the epistemology of slow and steady and deliberate documentation of, uh, of an object? I mean, that too is an object, but it's a, it's a different kind. That question mic check I just turned it on. okay y'all can hear me okay cool that question just blew my mind I'm like ah coding scraping Instagram <laughs> or data mm -hmm. Ooh, okay I'm I'm definitely more I'm a historian I'm not a preservation planner so I'm like I don't know <laughs> that just, that's beyond my skill set um this conversation is amazing but, a number of the folks on the panel were just at a cultural heritage preservation summit yesterday. And some, some of the same terms were actually coming up, which I found fascinating, this notion of stewardship, people who are stewards um, versus what we would call traditional preservationists, uh, the kind of inverse idea of value. What do we value? How does a community value a place? The, the timeline that you were talking about, Kim, like the we had to go through farming seasons, not our seasons. I'm like, oh, because our seasons, they don't matter technically in, in, in the rural world. Okay. Um, like this is, this is some really 
good stuff to to think about. I don't know, Randy, if you had any um, responses or anybody else had thoughts. I wanted to make sure that you feel like so, I mean, I think the one thing that I would follow up with um, is that, you know, you sort of talked about the valuing the object. Um, I think the thing that I kept coming back to was sort of status and power, right? So, so these things matter. And there are those who tell us what matters who or, or who told us at some point that they matter. And we have continued with that. But there's always this question, right? The sociological question is always sort of who benefits from, from that. Um, and so even when you think about what is taught and what isn't, right? This person was talking about basically accessibility to status and power. And usually the people who have the status and the power don't want that kind of accessibility right? They want you to go here and not go here. They want you to believe this story of our history and not this one. Um, and they want control over how that information is gathered, what we, who is allowed to do that, because the more accessible it becomes, the more we can start to um, privilege mm -hmm. those things that have been de-emphasized or, or hidden or, or devalued. Um, and so I think that that was the thing that in sort of a sociological imagination, right? It isn't just about intergroup relations. It, the, thing, the thing we value, unfortunately, in advanced capitalist society is status and power. Can I pick up from that? One of the things that I heard all three of the responses is that you know in various ways you see your work and, and society in different ways centering more on the relationship between heritage and social processes or social phenomena um, in different ways at different scales different time scales i also hear different geographical scales because it's not just about like understanding the monument but understanding the place more broadly mm -hmm. um, and then so we, we think about that relation in in terms of geographical scale, in terms of time, but also agency. And, and I think particularly for this discussion that's organized around um, the, uh, the idea of a profession that is devoted to preservation, devoted to heritage, that these issues are really consequential to us, and especially for the students. So it, this, this question is more objective. Pointed to, towards the students is that as, we, as one thinks about um, opening up this question about who has agency to make decisions about value, the decisions about what kinds of methods we use, about how fast we go, and on and on. Um, like what's the, what is the future, what should the future look like in terms of how that agency gets shared while still maintaining some semblance of a profession where we have mm -hmm. standing enough to kind of to you know to, to put our imprint on it to make suggestions about how to document um, you know what gets what gets acknowledged as heritage. How do you see those two things getting rebalanced? Uh, I, I can maybe start. One of the things that uh, I have a couple of PhD students uh, who are interested in their primary field being preservation. And they're like, so did I miss something? Or did I like, is there not really like a, a literature <laughs> for the field of preservation? I'm like, well, no, you you didn't miss it so much as it's it's uh, documented in all these different disciplinary venues and and boxes, and it's not as readily accessible within the academic enterprise of knowledge sharing, and has but is widely shared amongst practitioners of preservation in various forms and forums. And one of the things that we as a profession and as a discipline think would need to do a better job of before we even tackle, well not before, but like while we're tackling this matter of expanding agency and making it more just in its and operation is that we have to actually be documenting our own agency 
and we're not doing a great job of that, <laughs> I would say, um, and not doing a job of evaluating how we're even doing that. So you have, you know, how many histories of SHPOs and CLGs can you readily find in any kind of academic journal or uh, major periodical, right? These are the primary entities that decide so much in the United States around heritage. And then looking more internationally, yes, there's been some studies of UNESCO and the World Monuments Fund, but frankly, like there's a lot going unsaid um, in a print format. Uh, a lot being shared in, you know, annual conventions and convenings around the world and within various geographies um, within specific countries. And so I don't think we know enough about our own agency to, to make the, the next pivot to how that agency can be better deployed towards the objectives that we're setting forth for ourselves. Sounds like good advice to your PhD students. I, you know, I'm eagerly hoping that they will stay in, in the field and actually write their dissertations, on something along these lines, yes. I actually had a, a quick response to that, which came up in a conversation I had yesterday. Uh, so, and this is this is very a, a very disciplinary kind of comment, like discipline field, so on and so forth. Uh, where in the conversations of this gathering of of folks who deal with black heritage sites, um, there are a lot of numbers thrown at people. Well, you know, there's only 500 and something, something, something registered Black architects in the United States of America, and there's only this many Black women architects in America, and it's only a percentage of a of one percent, you know, and and da 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 da. And then someone said something along the lines of, "Where there, you know, there's less than 60 Black architecture professors in the United States," and I was like, "I don't even know if there's that many." I don't know who's keeping track. <laughs> like, I'm not sure that that is true. I mean, sure, there's less than 60. There might be less than. I think it's a lot less than that, but. 40, there might be less. Anyways, um, but then I was thinking, and as for Black historic preservation professors, well, we're, we're here, and there's <laughs> a couple more I can think of. Um but it goes to the age old question and I, hey, we're here to, we're here to talk. Mm -hmm. So we don't have a professionalization system. We, we're not in the credit. You don't get accredited to become a historic preservationist. There is no, and we can always say, well, there, there, there are organizations that want to give us accreditation. Um, we, we, our preservation department, I'm, I'm saying this to our, our colleagues here on the, on the panel. We reside in a school of design that gets accreditation because it has to go through accreditation for an architecture board in a planning board, right? But our department, like our department isn't necessarily, it doesn't have a professional accreditation, but the, the field doesn't have a, I don't know that we want to go that route, but I think that's part of the issue that you're talking about. I also think it's part of the nebulousness where you can have a room full of people who are literally stewards of sites and landscapes who go, but I'm not a pre preservationist. No, 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 no. You know, no, 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 I don't consider myself. So it's, it's one of those tricky things where I'm not necessarily advocating for more professionalization and like you need a stamp to be able to say that you're a preservationist. You need a stamp to say I can do this kind of documentation. I don't think that's what we need. Um, but I think that speaks to the issue that you're talking about. Uh, because quite frankly, it's it's are are we a, a, a discipline in terms of methods? Is it a field of thought or is it is it a practice? So on and so forth. And I, I promise you so many people I talked to over the past couple of weeks, specifically in, in Philadelphia, who are sites say is that like I'm a steward of the site. I'm not a preservationist. Um, 
Yeah. Oh, I have no idea. Yes, no? Yeah, okay. Um, so both uh, Camille and Amber, what you said um, about, in a way, about institutions, mm -hmm. right? Um, and Randy, your question to us was, you know, what do we do to improve the way that we um, teach around these kinds of questions um, looking forward? What I've been struck by constantly is um, those of us who, and I think, well, maybe Camille and I are sort of the most tangential to the 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 universe, the institutionalized universe of of, of preservation. Um, those of us who dip our toe into this universe um, constantly feel the power of big institutions. Um, and Lynn Meskel's the chronicler of UNESCO, which is you know the big elephant in the room, but there are lots of them, right? And you're talking about them, their, their presence or absence in your in your field. Um, and it strikes me vis-a-vis -vis who has the power <laughs> um, that there's this immense gap between these institutions and the people on the ground. Mm -hmm. um, and certainly my work in Italy as a foreigner, as an American foreigner, um, and as some, but also as someone who was trying to navigate between this um, elephant-like institution, which is the, the cultural heritage institution of the Italian government, um, with people who, you know, farmers who are barely scraping a living, that there was this immense uh, sort of space between them. And we found ourselves constantly um, in sort of horrified awe at this gap. And the, um, the treatment of ordinary people by the heritage apparatus, right? They looked down their nose at them. They had zero interest in these issues of scale and time and the rhythm by which these people had to um, make a living. Uh, and there seemed to be zero space between these, in this, uh, this gap between institutions and people. And um, it strikes me, I mean, that's a tiny version of a story that preservationists encounter the world over, which is why one, so, so many of these conversations are so um, strife-filled, right? These, these conversations between institutions and people. And there really has to be a better way. Um, and I'm sure that that's part of what you're all brainstorming here, right? As you all are setting off on careers um, to do uh, versions of historic preservation. But I think that that has to be a really big one and how you plug that gap. I think that better way is something that has been confronted by essentially every profession uh, working, whether it's in you know kind of public health or environmental conservation or any any connection to you know to between like the, the transformation of a particular thing or place and larger social benefits is going to fall into that gap potentially, right? So it's a, it's a top governance question. Um, the uh, let me turn turn that turn that the energy of that question to another aspect of the heritage field more more particularly, you know, our preservation field is built on this idea or from these ideas about material heritage. But we all acknowledge that there are not material um, aspects of heritage that we can understand that different professions can, can help us model. And to folks outside of the professions, maybe even matter more, like these ideas about the past or tradition might actually be more, more meaningful or consequential than the material stuff. Um, so that's another you know, kind of balancing act that the field is, that, that, that's, that's up, up, up for question, I think, in, in, our, in our field for sure. Um, in, in your various encounters with various social groupings or publics, um, how do you see that, uh, do you see that, that mix changing between kind of reliance on material things as representations of heritage and, you know, other other ideas that uh, that get counted as heritage or have power as heritage. Because depending on your answer, we have to either slightly revise or totally rebuild the field. <laughs> no pressure. No pressure. <laughs> yeah. um, no, sorry, I didn't know Camille was about to start. No, I, I don't. So I think, you know, symbolism is really important. And so I don't, 
I don't know that it is, I don't know that the question, that the answer to that particular question matters as much as you might think it does. Because again, the, the monuments themselves, the buildings, whatever, whatever has been valued and preserved in that way, and um, it symbolizes something. Right, so it's the meaning that becomes attached to that. And in some instances that it is then what challenges people to say, well, why does this matter and this doesn't? Or maybe it's that we know why this matters and this doesn't. And it's, it's what drives a people to say, well, we want, we want somebody to pay attention to this over here. And so, I don't know, for me at least, while I think there are sort of non-object aspects of heritage that are certainly important and, and, and there is inequality in the value placed on those across, you know, all of the categories that I study. Um, in and of itself, I don't know that that matters so much. Um, because again, we are socialized to believe that those things have meaning. And then we're told what that meaning is and how much value we should place on that, right? Around patriotism, around, and in fact, when, when we want to destroy another group, we destroy their monuments, right? So, we're not just destroying the object, right? We're destroying all of, we're, we're, we're disrespecting, we're destroying everything that, that that monument symbolizes. And that can be culture and that can be food and it can be, you know, all kinds of things that are not objects. Hmm. Yeah, I, can I just jump in? I would totally agree with this. I actually think that it's sort of in my world, people have just doubled down on the monument. Right, the massive expansion of cultural heritage tourism um, is not been erased by Instagram. People want more of it rather than less. And even though the monument disappears in 60 gajillion selfies and no one even looks at it anymore when they go and visit, it doesn't matter, right? Right. You, the, you, there's okay. this, it, yeah, right? Like this constant emphasis yeah. on the damn monument. And the, I mean, poor and working people just want a piece of that. They don't want to say, just blow it all up, mm -hmm. right? They're like, how can we get our monument? Right? There's got to be something in the Met that we can get back and put in our village and people come and visit <laughs> um, rather than rather than it than a, a conversation that's a different conversation, right? Um, so in a way, uh, the, the that kind of gradient of power and authority that takes place around these immovable things is in in a ways it gets even worse. I have to flip this whole monument conversation bit because I inhabit the a, a program at my school of architecture that's real estate development <laughs> sustainable real estate development excuse me <laughs> and uh and the in many ways the profession of architecture for better or for worse i do teach a preservation policy and planning class where like the first module is the history of how we got to where we are at now policy wise and it's kind of like why we all jumped in on the the federal historic tax credit and then the states followed suit mm -hmm. but and while we've despite many you know every time there's a state budget crisis the historic tax credits come up for debate like do we keep the historic tax credit or the film credit you know and this is you know this is this debate that goes on in state legislatures and there's been at times debate on the in congress about the federal historic tax credit program uh but we have built a monument to the tax credit. <laughs> yeah, the tax credit is a monument that is a very hard one to tear down in preservation because of what it actually demonstrates that we value. We value preservation having economic value to communities mm -hmm. and to the individuals and institutions who are investing in the values that we claim are important, right? the longevity of the built environment and so forth and so forth. Uh, and so it's not just that we, you know, it's about economic value, it's about us big tenting preservation, right? 
you don't have to really be a preservationist with a capital P. You just have to like, you know, rehab this one building and make it economically productive so that it has value in the place that it's in. And you too are a preservationist, even if you don't claim that identity, right? And you're part of the constituency when somebody comes to tear down our monument, right? You're gonna be like, no, no, no. The historic tax credit is really, really important. Preservation and, and all that is involved, the whole system that scaffolds it, right? The various administrative entities that determine what properties and projects actually qualify and yada, yada. So we have, a value system within preservation that is highly centered around us having value to others, not just, and the work that we do having value, not just the objects having value. And now we can make a new monument <laughs> that, that shows that we're, we actually are not um, exclusively oriented towards the the object-based work that we do having value to this broader world but this other like stewardship of the institutions that we are involved in the um the the documenting of the practices right whether those are agricultural or or architectural that ensure that these built um these properties remain with us, right? These are other things that we do that are of value. But the question would be, what's gonna be our monument for that? Like, what's gonna be the thing that we trot out, that the National Trust trots out to every legislator's office and can put in a one pager for all their staffers to be like, yes, you know? The, the problem with the intangible heritage um, value system is not the value itself, but that it's harder to identify this thing that we're all going to be fetally rally, you know, around. rally around. Uh, and, and then that has value in all these different kinds of places, red states and blue states, and, you know, all the different kinds of places within our specific, you know, U.S. context. The, I will say the one thing that is emerging is um, as a replacement for the, it's become an object unto itself, which is the community. So you can get, um, there's been a lot of investment of these other federal agencies like FEMA in particular around communities that are being, um, quote unquote, erased, decimated, and so forth, significantly damaged by various storm events and climate change more chronically. And there are people who are invested in that, and which is why there's now federal programs of Gazoo that invest in the survival of communities. And in that, there's the work of preservation happening. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, that's the that's the the bucket that we can attach ourselves to and say we are for that and that is our that's our our north star, but it would entail a little bit of us saying that our letting go of deciding where the tent ends, right? We want a big tent, folks, but we want to like leave out certain people. <laughs> With community, that's just like it's just a far more encompassing. Mm -hmm. And we don't get to be as um, intentional about who gets to be a part of it. That's that's actually super helpful in thinking about another question. And I don't know how we're doing on time. So if we have like, <laughs> okay, okay, cool. Um, this is actually a big hard question, <laughs> but your what your point speaks to this. Um, it's a longer question because it's trying to do too much. Um, thinking about social justice issues and opportunities. And so the question is, what are the possibilities for preservation to serve as a means of structural redress? So I think this like the FEMA community 
self-preservation approach is something that's opening up our possibilities for this conversation. Um, but again, what are the possibilities for preservation to serve as a means of structural redress from past inequities and erasures? as well as policies such as redlining, urban renewal, highway construction, and the urban and built environment. Uh, more broadly, what are reparative possibilities for heritage and its preservation? I think that even the example of curriculum that you gave us second and fifth grade curriculum showing how farming processes of the archaeological not the archaeological world the ancient world um connect to the present like i think curriculum development is a reparative process quite frankly mm -hmm. um among many but what are ways that we can see maybe if not preservation with the big p but this notion of connecting the past of caretaking historic resources in communities to inform the present how how can that work as a means of structural redress or, or a reparative possibility mm. Yes. <laughs> I would like to see it work that way. <laughs> so it's like, yes. <laughs> no. No, no. All right, I'm no, going to no. say this, but I don't know if I actually believe this. But um, OK, just because y'all aren't saying anything. So um, I'm just giving you time to think here. <laughs> Preservation. I'm, I've always had the hell does that conservation pre all right y'all have a conversation around these say words it. in your discipline say it. um right th this um this kind of doubling down on non-change nostalgia and a bunch of other things that go into that word um these are particularly for poor people these are tough right these are tough concepts um, because they mean taking a thing or a place or whatever and sort of sticking it outside the arc of time in which there are a bunch of decisions that get made, inevitably not by you. Um, and the um, and then, right, we have the whole sort of infrastructural thing that grows up around that placing the object out of out of time, right? out of the cycles of exigency, right, which drive ordinary people's lives. Um, and the that whole act, right, is there's so many places for that whole thing to go wrong. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, if if we could think about ways in which preservation becomes less preservation-y, um, and less about taking things in places out of time um, and sort of recycling them back into uh, the the stuff and place and things that people need that are by definition constantly changing. Um, that sounds flexible. It sounds like there's a lot more place for different kinds of people's agency. Um, I don't know. It's complete. It's obviously completely against what everyone in this room does for a living. But um, but it's also what we hear like ninety nine percent of the time, right? Um, or at least what I hear ninety nine percent of the time. I've often asked, "Isn't preservation just asset management with a different <laughs> north star objective?" Well, yeah, because right? I'm sitting here thinking about all of the dilapidated houses in my neighborhood, right? It's an historic black neighborhood in Philadelphia. And instead, they're tearing those. Well, I mean, there are some people who are flipping them. But that means they're not they're not preserving the, you know, the st old stone row houses, they're, they're modernizing them. Um, or they're tearing buildings down and putting up those god awful cardboard box looking apartment buildings that just don't fit the character of the neighborhood. Right. And so you talked about FEMA and and preservation of communities impacted by climate change, but you could also talk about historic preservation in 
traditionally disadvantaged communities um, that makes far more sense, right? If you think about the people who actually live in those communities who might be able to stay if there was a movement around trying to sort of protect what is already there rather than making it new and better and pushing out well, this is so one of the conversations. So I do a lot of my research in coastal communities that are historically um, racially mixed in their kind of fullness, but have a very close knit community of people of color that has survived generations, right? Mm -hmm. That community, those ties. And the survival of the community and the culture and the cultural practices, and quite frankly, the cultural economy mm -hmm. that banks on all of that depends less on whether the architecture is the beautiful brownstone or the Victorian coastal architecture that around that all of these people inhabited and built this community around, and more whether these families continue to own the land right. and through that operate as stakeholders in what happens in this place. Mm -hmm. And so there's a lot of questions around, well, if I can, and us as people who own this property continue to own it, but tear down the structure that was built in 1890 or 1940 or whatever, and build something that allows us not only to continue to occupy it as you know, an extended family and it be the thing that it has functioned as before, but also be able to capitalize on the cost of doing that, right? Mm -hmm. So the cost, well, capitalize on the economy revolving around that cost, right? So sure, we could have an additional accessible dwelling unit on the property. We could have, or in as part of the structure as a whole, if we, demolish what currently exists and build something else in its place. Isn't that real preservation? Yeah. Isn't that conserving yeah. the culture, the intangibility that people come here in droves to be a part of and experience and post all over Instagram, right? That is what people are coming here for. That is what we've been coming here for for generations. It is not for the gabled roof and the ecclesiastical cornices, right? So this is the kind of, uh, that's the asset management mindset wise that people are engaging in with a different ultimate objective. And, but in the same time scale that we actually think of preservation, like such that it exists beyond the usability of the now with the people who currently have it now, mm -hmm. so that some descendants might be able to actually have it, mm -hmm. right. decide at that juncture what to do with it. Right. But that's not a possibility in, in many, many cases. I just came from Sag Harbor and it's just like, you know, like that's not gonna happen if we don't, in some cases, cash in mm -hmm. as opposed to cash out, mm -hmm. right? We don't cash in now while things are moving the way that they're moving in the market. There's, we will be priced out mm -hmm. and have to cash out. Right. And, and that is, um, and there, and then people do ask, well, what is wrong with that? Right. We could do that and we can take the proceeds of that and invest it in the companies that are doing the development in this community. And we're no longer the individual house historic house owner, we are the company that is investing in the rental re resort stock or the rental apartment stock in the neighborhood. So I think that there's like, there's different ways in which people are thinking about preservation that's not in the, aligned with our various kind of criteria by which we do this work, but it doesn't mean that they're completely like on some other reservation, so right. to speak. But they're doubling down on change. Yeah. Right? Change is preservation. 
less preservation-y preservation and more change-y preservation. This, it, you know, it's, it's landscape preservation. There's this great article that I enforce on every, everyone who takes my classes, like, you know, it, it, written by an ecologist. It's called, title is Landscape Preservation and Oxymoron, <laughs> because landscapes right. are supposed to change, but preservation right. ostensibly in his mind is about not changing. Right. We realized that, I'm really glad that this came sharply onto the table about, you know, uh, what we call what we do, because even if we are like super um, aggressive and and uh, and on point and creative about reimagining preservation practice, if it's still called preservation practice, that might eliminate um, you know all of these connections that we're hoping to or preclude the possibility of all these connections that we're wanting to make to you know co stewardship or or educational or otherwise. So um, you know back to and I'm, I'm seeing over your all heads the preservation features name like that might be there there is a discussion field at large and here as well about what we call the practice departments and how we identify how do we connect to it so um I was having a conversation about like what should it be named <laughs> you, know, you all have five seconds to you know say what your version of it is but I think that the naming is not an idle point um, because you know to the, to Camille's point about symbolism, um, to uh, to uh, Fallon's point just now that like preservation of own, real estate of ownership of real estate might right. be an object, not the building yeah. be an object. Yeah. Um, those all yeah. more robustly to these broad and fuzzier conceptions of heritage. But that more, in my mind, more accurately describes what we want to do, what we want to signal to others that we're interested in. Mm -hmm. so I would say, like, I'm actually curious about what it's like for you to, to be in something that talks about heritage and preservation in the United States. Because, like, for me, that's very off-putting, right? It's very um, pilgrimy. Right, revolutionary war. It's 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 a place where it's it's just a very white Eurocentric place, right? And and so I, you know, I just sort of imagine undergraduates thinking about something that they might want to do, and I think particularly in a moment where there is, you know, just sort of great emphasis on colonization and decolonization that something that is called heritage preservation um it, i mean it is challenging it would seem to me <laughs> so i mean not to put you on the spot and if you don't want to answer it i don't understand the look over there to the wall though yeah, I mean, I understand if you don't want to answer it. I'm just saying, like, it's fine. No, it's funny because that that actually came up in our conversation about the name of the department. I was like, "Ooh, I don't want to use heritage. I don't know that we can use that now. Like, that's not really like because what heritage? Whose heritage? And it's it's funny because at a certain point, it seemed like I'm just speaking from a personal and pers professional perspective, like. I was the fuddy-duddy of my friends and um, they couldn't understand for the longest time what I did, family included actually, now that I'm thinking about it. And it got to the point when 2017 happened, when Charlottesville mm -hmm. happened. And I, I went to UVA for my master's and I was like, cool, I'm gonna be out here like ASAP. <laughs> I thought I was going to get my doctorate there. Then I was like, no, I'm not. I'm leaving. I can't stay here. Then all of a sudden people are like, oh, monuments matter. Uh, I'm like, I've been trying to say this this whole time. But from a different standpoint of like, why is this what it is? Like why? So actually my entry into preservation was in a school of architecture but I was looking at my grandfather's neighborhood in DC, Lee Joy Park. I'm always go back to my grandpa who would say uh, how majestic his neighborhood was. But I knew that neighborhood in the 80s and 90s. And it was what people called the hood. I mean, they're like, ah, I wouldn't go over there if I were you. And I'm like, I've been coming here since I was a kid. Like, I don't really have an option. Uh, <laughs> this is where my family is. 
And so my entry point into preservation wasn't the pilgrims, but through a disinvested black neighborhood mm -hmm. where then I could ask all the questions about why, why does Lee Droit Park look like this? Now it's hyper gentrified. Mm -hmm. It's one of the fastest, quickest gentrified neighborhoods in the United States in the 20 teens. But at the time, this is 2000, 2003, when I'm doing my senior thesis, why does Lee Droit Park look like this and Georgetown looks like that? Mm -hmm. So like that, but but that was my entry into preservation, but it still has from what Kim has said and from what Camille, you said, it still has the, the connotations of the pilgrims and nostalgia and rocking chairs and like things of that nature. But I certainly came into it from a policy in an actionable, like pushing the notions of what gets invested in and valued. We talk about valued versus what gets devalued and how that shows up in the built environment, which is not, I guess, when people think about preservation, that is well, not. And, and, or heritage. And that's what I'm saying. Yeah. So, so in a sense, you were already in an architecture environment. It's true. Right. And so I don't, I mean, I guess I'm just saying like, if, if part of this is attracting students from outside of an architecture or a policy environment, that heritage and preservation just, again, symbolizes That's something pretty specific. So I've, I had this, that, that visceral reaction when I was, um, so I kind of was recruited into historic preservation. My internships were in historic preservation, working for the Smithsonian and their division of historic preservation, which works on all the buildings and part of the National Mall and such. And then um, working with someone who, I was trained as an engineer first and working on that side of doing historic structures reports. and. Um, so very much on the materiality of the thing and how to make sure that this thing continues to stand into perpetuity, or at least until a specified date where this material is going to deteriorate and we need to replace it with something else. But the point being that like, it was very clear, even as somebody who was coming into architecture and into preservation from outside of it, that the preservation was about what was historic and some people, and then, you know, of course I then learned who those people were, decided what constitutes historic. And that that was a very specific category of things, but we all, I will say, oh, I'm gonna kind of be generous. We'll recognize that that is a very problematic praxis in which that is being determined uh, in terms of what qualifies as a historic property, historic place and such. That was the category that made it okay. Mm -hmm. The, but then I did work outside of the United States where heritage is the word. And this whole I, thing that you would have like historic be this determining filter for who's doing the work and how we're doing it and what we're doing work on was, was not really a thing. And so uh, working in Panama, the UNESCO sites and UNESCO was considering adding another site to the list. And they, uh, that was my foray into how the term heritage was used globally. And what I came away from that was that it was the term utilized for the ancient and, and it's, descendants in terms of like modern colonial architecture uh anywhere and everywhere and but it was at a juncture in time it was also it was like 2006 when i was in panama where the kind of grassroots heritage movements of the rest of the world are bubbling up and and the u.s context is receiving that kind of literature and they're saying heritage is it's like a global south yeah. thing yep. we in the north the global north have definitions for what we consider to be worthy of preserving and and so yes other people think heritage is whatever they value 
but we think we have like rubrics. We have rubrics and we have criteria and, and a lettered from A to F, you know, like we, we have a whole system by which we operate and an apparatus for that. Those people over there, they have heritage. And if those national trusts of all those respective countries want to continue to kind of, if they want to, how they engage with that is, is really like their problem, right? But here in the United States, like we've solved the problem preemptively. And, and so that's, I think, is this weird junction that we would find ourselves here in as US educational institutions, because it, it wouldn't just be seen as we're kind of expanding the definition to people, the regular, the you know, regular Joe who sees heritage everywhere, but that we're extending our lens to the to the world and that those move heritage movements of the world are now part of what we do. Oh. And I'm not sure that many institutions are willing to make that claim or take okay. that claim. I'm just going to make one um, point of note on time. I did, if there are some questions. Great discussion. I, 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 somewhere there's a, I think an acknowledgement that you made about the efforts to take back this notion of heritage from its white supremacist roots and to, uh, and to, and to, bring its ownership out into question. And the, the event that we all, that, that um, Fallon and, and Amber and I were at yesterday, I think was was one substantial note of evidence to that. Mm -hmm. um, I, I per, you know, if I keep you in the word, like I certainly, I'm not a member of the Heritage Foundation. Um, <laughs> you know, so I, I, my work, I, you know, at some level, I think you know, my work personally is about taking it back mm -hmm. from that. Um, and, and, you know, and demonstrating that it's a more generous, um, it's a debate. It's not, mm -hmm. it's not settled. But I will second. note that there's the way it's been used is cultural heritage. It's almost like we're we're trying to make sure that when we use it, it's it's distinguishable. So I I rarely see it without cultural in front of it. Right. When it's being used by U.S. institutions, and maybe that's just my. I have yeah. to say it. It really. I I have a, a chapter uh, well, article that that Rainy actually didn't publish where I use the term African American American title. But like, this is what I'm talking about right here. I'm not talking about the other stuff. No, I, I was actually just gonna say what you said, which is the other option is to just lean into those crazy terms, mm -hmm. right? It, lean into them in the sense of, this is what we do. You think this is nuts, don't you, right? Like you have a visceral reaction to this. Let's Let's start with that. Right. Let's start with that and 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 use that to undermine this. And I talk about I, I speak as someone who's come from a classics department, right? right? That's trying to come up with <laughs> another name for what in the world that is that we do. And a there's the problem of what other word are you going to use? They're all equally terrible, right? And then the other possibility, right, is to change what it means, right? Little known fact: real estate fact. Washington, uh, the former headquarters of the National Trust for Historic Preservation. Now owned by, they sold it to the Heritage Foundation. No way. <laughs> I assume they knew who they were. It's the Heritage <laughs> Foundation. They sold it. Uh, they sold it to the Heritage Foundation. Right. And then they moved to the Watergate. And now they're like in yeah. Right. Speaking about physical, a it's an organization that's about preserving physical spaces. Wow. Went from a mansion on Dupont Circle to co-working. To co-working. Yeah, to the Watergate. That's awesome. Working. You can't make up that stuff. <laughs> so if, if it's okay with you all, we just, we just have a few minutes left. Thank you so much. That was really, really awesome. I, I love you all very much. Um, considering all the things you, you in the the perspective of the two of you who are in the field, um, what you think the greatest potential for the for, for preservation as a field is right now, considering, considering this and the that and Sure. 
and then maybe from out that same question, what do you see as potentially the greatest potential that we should be harnessing in the field to, to sort of act, you know, you've been presenting to us. So one of the things, I think I started this by saying how like less and less often my training and documentation is of value in what I do. Um, but that's partly because what we've defined as worthy of that documentation is narrowing. Like, you know, people are like, oh, all the historic, really historic places with integrity have already been documented in historic district, and you were kind of like done, you know. <laughs> um, and but what we I believe have the potential to do, and I would actually say a responsibility and urgency to do is tackle the built environment, the fabric, both the buildings and the landscapes of, well, let's just keep it in the United States for now, um, of the United States in a way, like we have to define, redefine how it is that we are going to inform decision-making about what exists. Because there are a, there's a much, there's a growing acknowledgement that what exists and the various things that have meaning to people, right? And that are valued with, within different value systems, even ones that we might take issue with are deteriorating are disappearing or just like under threat in some way. And like, you know, every state and city now heritage organization, uh, historic organization has a most endangered places and perils list, right? And it's always in the random odd number, nine, 11, 13, whatever, right? And, and we could be doing that at the scale of, and at the scope of what actually exists in the built environment, but more, it's, it's getting there, I would actually say, but there's a lot of potential for us to be key information givers, data drivers, but also framers of the kind of knowledge that's necessary to make decisions about what happens in the future in various realms, whether that is around housing and like housing, affordable housing preservation, people talk about it all the time. They're talking about units, right? They're not talking about the fabric in many cases, but they will not send you away if you can actually do a study and survey of an area and tell them how many units are in an area, but also what is the nature of those units? What is their relationship? Like we have architectural knowledge, spatial understanding. We have a sense of, yes, there are units, but those units are gonna be completely crap in five years time, right? And you're gonna have to finance a new set of units. Like we have knowledge that we're not deploying because we're so focused on, on or funneling that knowledge into a set of prescribed outlets. And so my the, where I see potential is for us to, Yes, we can continue to do nominations and continue to work the, the kind of an NPS system to the full extent of that, that that affords us, but that we can also do this other work that helps others see who are not, you know, as in the weeds of the field, see value in what we do and see how we can be of value to what they do. I have a quick answer. We y'all are actually are experts in change. Lean into that. If you were to expand what what was valued, right? I mean that really starts to upset some apple cards. Um, it starts to force us to consider different understandings and stories and and histories um that you know that again i think we're starting in the united states we're starting in a more symbolic way right 
right? So, um, you know, if you, I was talking about working for the Smithsonian and just looking at monuments, but I thought about Monticello. And so now they will at least pay for it. And they rehabilitated some slave quarters, right? But, but there is a lot of that history that doesn't make us look so good as a country that has been purposefully hidden. And the same is true with indigenous people and indigenous land and, and all kinds of things. And so there, yeah, there is great power in that. Um, and it also makes it dangerous for some people, right? Um, to me, that's all the more reason to lean in and do it. But I do think that that's important. And I, and I think that that would be attractive, right? I think that there's a, there's a generation of students who aren't coming in necessarily from architecture or engineering who would see that as really meaningful and powerful and interesting. Great. I'm afraid we're going to have to leave it for time um, because everybody has something else to want to. This was super generative and valuable. And, um, and I want to thank all of you for all the thoughtful comments. We're going to, Amber and I are going to be writing up a digest piece for uh, a journal called Platform. Meanwhile, I think Frank has his marching orders to go write that memo to College Hall. We're going to be the Department of Change. <laughs> I took notes. Former Department of Classics. <laughs> that's, that's actually maybe do some other recruiting. <laughs> well, um, first, I want to thank Amber and Randy for pulling together an amazing panel. You sure know how to make good panel. Um, really, you have set us off on a fantastic uh, trail to come. Um, please, those in the room and on Zoom, uh, join us on January 25th for Preservation Futures, which will look at the humanities. Um, and panelists, thank you so much for giving your time and some really terrific material to work from. Thank you.